Traditions, but uh, his father did not want him to get into that because he did not want 
is said to become a monk. <laughs> so he tried many ways to indulge Siddhartha in pleasure, in entertainment. But Siddhartha was, uh, when he was nine years old, he already liked that. Very spiritual, very contemplative. So it was quite difficult for his father to find things that uh, pull him away from his contemplation practice. He held so many festival, entertainment events, dancing, drinking. Most of the time, Siddhartha did not participate. He was there just for the in the beginning, and then he went out in the garden and let his friends and other people enjoy. He went out in the garden and played flute. So other people who enjoyed that come out and be with him. But he was not in that entertainment mode. So there's something. We talk about nature and nurture. So Siddhartha was born with what you can call a seed that like quietness, relaxation, looking deeply into things. Siddhartha already experienced that uh, as a nine years old boy, Devadatta shot down the bird, which was an act of violence for a nine years old boy to see. And he also see that even he was right in some way of saving the animals. But many people say that Devadatta was right. So violence seemed to have an upper hand. Uh, the truth belongs to the strong. That's what it is. And during that time, also uh, the caste system have already been established. And he, Siddhartha, did not like that caste system. There was the Brahmins, the warrior state, the worker, the trader caste, and then the slavery caste. And it was set up by human. So he was not happy. India at that time, at the time, the Buddha which is about 500 BC. There's many different accounts of the Buddha birth date, but nowadays the scholars usually agree that the birth date of the Buddha was about 485 to about 405 BC based on archaeological records, historical fact. So it's about this time. And the old date was about 80 years earlier. But today, this one makes more sense, based on historical and archaeological records. At that time, Indian society, have already have some kind of caste system. So you have the caste system. <coughs> you have the Brahmin, Brahmin. The warrior, the king, the trade man, 
just did a service delivery. They mark actually in terms of belong to the lower caste. It already set up for about a few hundred years when Sita Town was born. So Sita Town could not know anything about it. He didn't like it, but he did not oppose it because it's already built in there. And even if, if he wants to oppose it, there's no way out either because he realized that change had to come from within. So the, the Brahmin thought that they were the highest caste. They were born from the mouth of the Brahmins. But the Buddha said, no, the Brahmins are humans, and as humans, they were born from their mother. So there was no thing that we were born from the mouth of the Brahmins. And everybody were born with the same status. That's, and the way that uh, people define the nobility, noble, Nobility is not on birth, from birth, but from the way that they live. So people from a lower caste can become noble. And people from what they consider a higher caste, the Brahmins, if they don't behave, they do bad things, they are not considered noble. So the Buddha was very clear about that. And he was asked to do, to practice, to participate in many royal court meetings. And what he realized was that in those meetings, even though they, they tried to do good things, but there was many fighting. People want to preserve their status, their powers. And even though those people are very corrupted, his father, the king, had to work with those people, with those corrupted people, to remain in power. So people had to take sides, even though his father was good. But there's many factions in the assembly, in the Congress. So in order for him to remain king, he had to partner with unwholesome factions. So Siddhartha was disappointed. Even though his father wanted him to become king, he said, what would I do? People is already like that. I could not do any better than you what you already did. And he thought that the way to change had to come from within. The way out is in. And that had to be a spiritual path. The way out has to be a spiritual path. And so what is this spiritual path?
that ignorance. Read hatred and ignorance are very close to us. The most in, in the term of light kind of greed is attachment. Greed is associated with attachment. Associated with our ignorance <coughs> is associated with duality. Attachments. Attachment is nice. But if the word attachment is really have a bad effect. So it is okay for our children to be attached to us. They need to have attachment. The children, the baby need to have attachment to their mother. So the bond can be made between the, the baby and the mother. So when the baby was just born, she smelled the male, the smell of the mother, and after that, the, the baby recognized the, the mother through the smell. They can tell, oh, not my mother. <laughs> she doesn't smell like my, my, my mother. So attachment is helpful, is needed for growth, for love. But then if attachment becomes a possessiveness, then it becomes very, very damaging. Same our children grow up, and we thought that our children belong to us, them to do the things that we have not <coughs> been able to do when we were young. We want them to live the life that we have not been able to live before. This happened a lot in many Asian families, Asian culture. Many Asian culture, uh, families want their daughter, their sons to become doctors. It's, it's like a tradition. When you grow up, you become a medical doctor. <laughs> so it's, this attachment become possessions. That's greed. And the Buddha, in the teaching of the Four Noble Truth, the first truth is suffering. We suffer because of birth, our age, sickness, and death. We suffer because of we are separated from our loved ones. Attachment. The first noble truth. We suffer because we have we are separated from our loved ones. We talk about attachment. Three. We suffer because we have to live with hatred one. That's aversion. Aversion means to push things away. 
and that's what you need to think the poor things close to us. We suffer because we don't get what we want. Basically, we don't get what we want because it's manifested in the form of we suffer because we are separate from our loved ones. We want to live with our loved ones. We are separate from them. That's we don't get what we want. We suffer because we have to live with the one we don't love. And that is, and we suffer because we don't get what we want. Now what do we want? What do we want? We want good things to happen to us, and we want bad things not to happen to us. Good, bad. And we are caught in duality point of view. So ignorance is basically the duality point of view. Between Mô Minh là nhị nguyên trong có gì? Cái gì nhị nguyên? Ignorant is a duality point of view. If we can deal, transform this duality point of view to no duality, then we are liberated. <coughs> and that's what the Buddha practiced. So what is good and what is bad? There is nothing bad or good. It's the mind that makes it so. It's from Shakespeare. Nothing is good or bad. It's the mind that makes it so. So Shakespeare talked about this 2,000 years after the Buddha. But he has a point. The weather was nice yesterday. This morning when the children walk out, it was windy, cold and raining. Is the rain good or bad? children want to play outside today. Yesterday, the weather was so nice. <coughs> we will play today. Oh, it's rain, it's so windy. We stay in indoor. So we don't just work bad. So in the mind, I make it so. That's where conflicts come from. We want something, but other people want different things. So the farmers, they are waiting for rain to come down. And Sydney have, have been a drought for some time. I heard that Melbourne's have more rain than Sydney in the past few months or so. So people from Melbourne, it has been raining for months. They come to Sydney and they want 
to have a sunny day to go out picnic with their friends. Oh, I'm so glad here. John, Kathy, come, let's have a picnic tomorrow, Saturday, come out. I have, Melbourne have so much rain that I really get sick of it. I want to go here and enjoy some sunny time. <coughs> John Kadri is from Sydney, and people there have been waiting for rain for months. <laughs> and the farmers want the rain to come down. And then when we are from here from Melbourne come up, we want to have a picnic day and it's rain, then conflict comes. So people want different things. And we have to live a balanced life. We have to take care of what we want and what other people want. So before we take care of what we want and what other people want, we want to take a look at our body. What is our body want? What we call the human being. Body and love and mind are two manifestations of the same entity called human being. At any given time, we are consist of mostly body and mind. They mix. But when we are asleep, we eat karma. We don't know anything. Basically, it's the body. Even though underneath, there's other things that function, but we don't. We're not aware of things about us. Then in karma. We're not aware of anything. And when we pass away, our body is no longer here. But we still exist in a different form. The Buddha already passed away 2,500 years ago, but we still think <coughs> about him. When we talk about something, that something exists. Ghost, do ghost exist? When we talk about them, they exist in our mind. So our parents, our ancestors, are still with us. So they exist in a kind of form of energy. That's something we are very sure of. Not only they exist in terms of form of energy, but they exist in the form of our eyes, our genes, some kind of special mark that we carry with us. My gene. Many people say that it comes from my maternal side. My mother's, my maternal uncle, mother had this kind of genes. They say, okay, you are from, and you, you the daughter, you are the son, you are the daughter of this. So they, the clan identification. <laughs> Sometimes we have to identify ourselves with ropes, round ropes, <coughs> corn hat, luminous moles in the list. So there was this, this kind of life force we call vitality.
life force. Always existing in many forms of beings. A flower has life force. A molecule has life force. Human beings and animals all have this life force. And all these life force have a tendency to propagate. As long as they exist in some kind of form, they all have this tendency to propagate. And we heard about the monarch butterflies in North America. They blend in with the environment around them. So that when danger comes, uh, the predator comes, they <coughs> blend it in, and the predator would not be able to distinguish them from the nature around them. It's a protective mechanism. It's a form of life force. So humans have this kind of life force at time. Our body have about eleven <coughs> organ system. Something that we are very familiar with, the chapter six. Respiratory. Skin, nail, eleven system. And we have one very important system. It's called the nervous system. All this body system work together to maintain, to keep the body alive. They have to work together to keep this body alive. One function, this one first of all, this one doesn't work. It will affect other system, for sure. The chat is system. If we eat things in and there's no way for things to go out, we suffer a lot. Suffer a lot. And for all this system to work together, they connect with this nervous system. There is a boss in the body. There is a boss. That boss is the central nervous system. That's why it calls central. Otherwise, it would not be called central. But this boss doesn't give power. It regulates by listening. It regulates by listening. So it check everything. Check everything. Do the doctor do the round in the hospital. Constantly checking all the system. 
in the body and make sure that they are working together correctly. If one system doesn't work right, if you alert and make no system to fix themselves. The problem is sometimes this system want to work alone. They don't want to work with other system. Too tiring. Too tiring to work with other people, with other system. When they work alone, when they don't care about other system, problems come. For example, the digestive system. I think they have a system called urinary system, right? Urinations, the kidneys. The digestive system takes in the food and it did preliminary filtering. It can filter out some toxics. Just enough the supply, a good supply of blood and oxygen reduction to other systems. But then if you pass some other thing that you could not digest it, the waste to other systems. So to the urinary system pass out as urinals and other kind of things. And if the digestive system did not filter out those things, the blood may not be pure, it can be contaminated. And the blood sent to the cells will not be good. And then the, the cell will be the food that transmits to the other cell will be contaminated. So it is that just the system doesn't work well to affect other things. So the requirement is, please, please work together this central nervous system say. If you don't, I will let you know. So if other system listen, things will be corrected. If not, they will fight and then illness happens. Just within our body, different systems need to work together in harmony. Now I'm talking about your system and my system have to work well together. So it's no wonder we quarrel a lot. Because you and I, fighting for the best chance to survive. And you have a different idea of how you best survive. I have a different idea of how I best survive. And my idea and your ideas are conflicting with each other. So remember, what, why we do not agree, why we quarrel, <coughs> have a biological aspect. In it. So don't blame yourself too much. You have the right to blame nature up to a certain point. Not always, but you can blame nature up to a certain point. I was born like that. Okay, I accept. You were born like that, you have the right to say so. I also have the right to say I was born like this too. A pizza has ten slices. Okay. A pizza, many slices. Okay. A 
a pizza. Ten people, ten slices. But for me to survive, I want three. It means two other people may not have it. We just need one tree, not one. It's because of these things here, our survival things. The bear wants to put their food for the summer, so the bear has to eat a lot. For six months, the bear has to be in the cave, so they have to eat a lot. It's cold, so we have to eat more because we have more, just more energy. So it's natural that for us that we want to have three pieces of pizza when we only entitled to one. So nature, we want the best thing to happen to us, and we think that the best thing for us is to have more. So we need to find a way to work with others. That's why this sutra coming in handily. The discourse on measuring and reflecting that we read this morning. I heard this words of the Buddha one time when he was staying with the Bhaga people in Samsu Magagri in the Deer Park. The Venerable Mahangu Gadayana addressed the Bhikshu, my friends. Suppose there is a Bhikshu who says to other Bhikshus, please talk to me. I want you to offer me guidance. I want to live with other people in harmony. If he is difficult to talk to, and down with qualities that make him difficult to deal with. Impatience, intolerance, not good at accepting constructive criticism, or the words of advice, and instructions from friends in the practice. Then those who practice the path of supply contact with him will think, he is not the one to be spoken to, he is not the one to be instructed, he is not someone to have confidence in. What are the qualities that make someone difficult to approach? It's not, it's not easy. In fact, it's quite lonely not to be accepted by other people. Whenever we go, people avoid us. We want to start a conversation, people are walking away. So this person is asking for advice. He's learning to work with other people, just like all the system in the body works together in harmony with other systems. My friends, a big group who is attached to Ronnie's eye and is controlled by Ronnie's eyes is difficult to approach and talk to. There are other reasons that make it difficult to approach and talk to him. A person praises himself and despises others. He is easily angered and mastered by his anger. Because he is angry, he bears a grudge. Because he is angry, he is bad tempered. Because he is angry, he speaks in a bad temper way. He accuses one who has corrected him. He disparages one who has corrected him. He corrects in turn one who has corrected him. 
He evades the criticism by asking another question. He changes the subjects. He manifests ill temper, anger, and scolding, <coughs> sulkiness. These are the qualities that make him difficult to approach to. So the system say, why you are so difficult in working with me? The digestive system said to the urinary system, I have done my job. Look, Peter is so much fat today. Look at the things he eats. He eats fries, he consumes Coca-Cola, many soda things. And I have to digest these kind of things. And uh, the heart system see that I need blood, I need oxygen right away. And he told me, please give me those things. And I have to digest these toxics. I can only do so much. So this cook, these sugary things, these fat things, If he eats healthy food, I don't have to do this much work, but he eats chunky food, poisonous food, so I have to do more work. So I have to just only be able to deal with, to do preliminary filtering. I have to pass this liquid to you, please. Let your kidney system, let your things take out the thing for me. And then the urinary system said, no, it's your child. I don't care, it's your job. And then the body gets sick. <coughs> so there was a story of uh, one snake who was bitten by the mosquito. It's quite itchy for him. He didn't have hands. So he didn't know how to, to scratch. Very itchy. So he had to find a way to kill the mosquitoes. He thought that if he killed the mosquito, his itchiness will go away. So what he did, he came out and lay on the on the road for the car to hit over him to kill the <laughs> the mosquito. Of course, the mosquito died, but he also died. <laughs> Usually, we are caught in our own things, and we take care of our own survival. We don't learn that our own survival is also the survival of others. So when we are in the Sangha, they always say the most important task of a practitioner is to build Sangha. And to build Sangha is meant that to live in harmony. <coughs> and to live in harmony we need to do self-reflecting and self-measuring. Husband and wife, they are they married to build a family. If they don't live in harmony, there will be no happy family. So they have to learn how to live in harmony. In order to do that, we need to learn about our differences. You see the monks and the nuns, when we do the chanting, the nuns usually put on the scarf. That scarf is, is a condition that we have 
in Buddhism, Vietnamese Buddhism for a long time. And that tradition of wearing scarf <coughs> comes from a tradition from a location in Vietnam. That, that place is called Bắc Ninh, so you know a bit about our culture too, right? It's a province well known for a very beautiful type of singing. Quang Hao. Very beautiful. Very attractive, very romantic. And usually young men and young women, they dress in traditional clothes. They sing. That woman put on Put on the head scarf and the nuns, you know, nuns in the old day model those scarf for the nuns to wear. <laughs> nuns are also women. As you see now, like uh, in uh, UK, when occasion comes, many women wear hats. They have that so expensive. Wedding, donations, Oscar things. Very expensive. So what is the kind of, of nature? And one time, it was in uh, Deer Park Monastery, and now uh, <coughs> they wanted us to have a arm brows. It was cold, January in San Diego, but they wanted us to have that kind of arm brows. The monks have to be, cannot wear any warm hat. But the sister, they were lucky, they wear a scarf. <laughs> and we look at the sister, I wish I could wear that scarf. <laughs> <coughs> so that I can be warm. <laughs> so what it is, is that we accept the different things. And when we see, okay, this man do this, and when do that, and we accept the differences. Just like these people do this, these people do that, we accept our differences. So for the husband and wife, in order to have a harmonious family, they need to accept their differences. And for people in the Sangha, in the community, need to be in harmony, we need to accept our differences. And exactly this one is the Sutra C. If we want to be accepted, to be easy to approach and talk to, we need to practice. Bhikkhu who is not caught in wrong desire and is not controlled by wrong desires, is easy to approach and talk to. He does not praise himself and despise others. He is not easily angered 
or master by his anger. Because he is not angry, he does not bear a grudge. Because he is not angry, he is not bad tempered. Because he is not angry, he did not speak in a bad tempered way. He did not accuse one who has corrected him. He did not disparage one who has corrected him. He did not correct in turn one who has corrected him. He did not evade the criticism by asking another questions. He did not change the subject. He did not manifest ill temper, anger, and scopiness. He succeeded in explaining his behavior when corrected. He is not jealous and greedy. He is not hypocritical and deceitful. He is not stubborn and arrogant. So there are the things that we need to practice so that we can accept others. And this sutra is called self-reflecting and measuring. Because living in the Sangha, we have every year we have the three months annual rain retreat. And at the end of the retreat, we are offered a letter of shining light. And in that shining light, we practice this sutra. <coughs> Dear Bhikshu, fellow Bhikshu, dear brothers and sisters, please shine a light on me. If in the past three months of practice, if you have heard, if you have seen, if you have any doubt on my practice, please shine a light on me. <coughs> And after that, we will call the Sangha and we will have to make a request. <coughs> the Sangha will get together and the one who asked for request to be shot in line had to come down, out, or kneel up and make that request. And he or she had to make that request. And then the Sangha will be open to offer the renewal, the shining light. In this case, we will have to be, I have more chance to live in harmony. So the way out is in. In here is to look deeply into ourselves. Do we have some capacity? Do we have some things? that make us difficult to approach? Do we have something that make us very easy to approach? And if we know what is good, what is not good, the key thing is to practice the four right diligence, which is if something bad, have not arise in our mind consciousness. Do everything to keep it down in our star consciousness. Our anger, our jealousy, our hatred. Mm -hmm. If they have not arise enough, keep them down there. And if they have arisen, we will create conditions for them to come down. If something good has not arisen in our mind consciousness yet, we create conditions for them to come up. And if they have arisen, we will create them, make conditions for them to stay there as long as possible. That's the practice of the four right religions. And it depends so much on knowing the good seeds, the good here. We have said that nothing is good and bad or bad. 
And now we introduce the thing that good or bad in here. Good and bad here, we talk about in the historical dimensions. In the ultimate dimension, nothing is good or bad. 75 million years ago, an asteroid came in and changed the weather, changed the whole the, the Earth ecology, the dinosaur passed away, new species come up. You see, dinosaur is worth bad. But to the later species, it's worth a very good event. Extremely good event. The humans is overcrowded the earth. Forty years ago, sixty years ago, it was only two point five billion. Now it's already almost seven and a half billion. In fifty years, it will be ten billion. The human is destroying the earth. One thousand years later, this ecosystem collapsed. It's bad for the human, but it's good for some other species. Thanks God, the human has disappeared. We have one million years to recover the earth. Let the Amazon forest be appear again. Let everything come up again. And a new species with a smaller brain will come up. <laughs> oh, everybody on the earth jump for joy. <coughs> and human was no longer there to celebrate. <laughs> it is a good thing, right? So what, what is good and what is bad? <laughs> I heard that Australia is preparing for the zero day. You know what zero day means, right? The day that Australia will run out of water. It's already happened in India. <laughs> One city completely out of water. Ten years, six more big cities will be out of water. So, looking at the big picture, it's bad. But Shakespeare said, nothing is good or bad. Well, of course, species will adapt. But now we're talking about historical, something that we have to deal with now. Something is good if we do that make us peaceful and happy. And something is bad if it gives us pain and suffering, that we are aware of the pain and suffering, that we are aware of the peace and happiness. So what is good and what is bad, what is bad for our retreat? Go back to our in-breath and our out-breath. Being aware of what's happening in the here and now. Taking good care of what happened in the present moment. We can transform the past and make our future better than this moment. Because if we can live happy, peaceful this moment, the next one can also be peaceful and happy. The way out is in, looking deeply into ourselves. We find a way out. A way out of greed, hatred, ignorance. The way out of attachment, aversions, <coughs> and duality point of view.